My name is Marlon Blake. I serve as one of the assistant dean of students. Uh, I got to meet with all of you earlier today. And so today our session is really focused, uh, primarily it's about being a first generation parent, but what I often tell people, what you probably heard from uh, earlier today, is that this session is really about how can you just support your students so this information is beneficial to, to all parents and families. So for a little bit of context here though, so when we think about the idea of being first gen, it's really about being the first in your family to go to college. So your parent or family member did not graduate from college. So you're considered to be a first generation student. That's how we define it here at St. Thomas. But if you look at like the larger definition, it also includes people whose parents graduated from a college that was not in the United States as well. So those are considered first gen. So, Here's some of the things I really want to emphasize about supporting your student uh, on this journey. And the first thing is about being ready for change. Now, for your student, this is probably going to be the most like traumatic change they've had in a really long time. Right? And so, but what I think is really important for you to know as a parent and as a family member is that it's normal. Like everything is going to be normal for them. And so there are going to be some, some changes that you notice whenever they call. And so for us at St. Thomas, we really like to think about this change as like thinking about it as a W. So, so don't be shocked in the first couple weeks when your student calls you, they're at the top of the W. Like everything is the greatest. St. Thomas is the greatest place ever. The food is great. My roommate is going to be at my wedding. Everything is going to be phenomenal, right? Well then usually the weeks go by, we get somewhere in like mid-October, they start going on Instagram, and they see all their other friends, and I'm like, oh my goodness. So then they're gonna call you, and this is gonna be the worst place ever, right? Like, the food is horrible, my roommate is the worst person I've ever met, like why did you ever let me come to this place, right? And so we kind of see that happen for students typically like in October is that they really start to really hate this place. And so then, typically, like mid-October, late October, like they'll call you and they're like, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it was, right? At this time, they probably made a friend, they made connections, they know where the classes are, they're kind of in a routine. So it's not as bad of a place as it was initially. So then, for those of us who celebrate Thanksgiving, Usually at Thanksgiving, they come home, you fed them, they slept in their old bed, they see all of their old friends, and on Sunday, you're literally going to have to like force them to leave. You're going to be like, you really have to leave my house, right? So we start to see students kind of have this lull again, and it's probably going to last all the way through winter break, right? Because now they've slept in their bed, now they've had this kind of home feeling, and it's kind of going to last a couple weeks for them. But I generally like to tell parents that like what we call J term, like other people call winter term, the winter break lasts about six weeks. So by the time that six week is over, they're going to be ready to leave your house and sprint back to campus. So then students find themselves back at St. Thomas is the greatest place ever, right? And they're going to go through these changes over time. But the point I really want to emphasize to you is that it is normal. So don't panic when your student goes from this is the greatest place ever to the worst place ever in a span of weeks. And for some students, it's going to be weeks, days, months, etc. But the moral of the story is they're going to go through this up and down period throughout their time. So specifically in the first year here, there's going to be a lot of change for folks at St. Thomas. So the second thing I really want to talk about is financial aid. What we know about students who leave our campus and most institutions in this country, most people leave because of money. So I really want to encourage you that if you have not to talk with their student about financial aid, about budgeting, about how much you expect it to pay, and to really ensure that they have dotted all the T's, no, dotted the I's and crossed the T's when it comes to financial aid. I really um, so sometimes what we know is that students miss a signature, they did not accept aid, so they maybe miss something. 
So I really want to encourage you to talk to your student about their financial aid package and what they got in that package. Because again, we know money is one of the main factors to why they leave St. Thomas. So with that being said, working on campus, what I'm about to say will sound counterintuitive. Um, but I really want you to encourage your student to work on campus. Now most jobs at St. Thomas are 20 hours or less and minimum wage just went up to $15 an hour in St. Paul, so now they'll make $15 an hour. But what we know about students who work on campus is that they often have higher GPAs, they're more likely to stay at St. Thomas, and they're more likely to graduate. So I really want you to encourage your student from the beginning to work on, on campus. Because again, it sounds counterintuitive. You're like, well, that's gonna be distracting, it's gonna take money. Like, it does sound counterintuitive, but just think about working on campus as a built-in support system. Not saying that Target and Aldi won't care about them as a student, but Aldi and Target don't care that you have a midterm. But your boss on campus may be more flexible with you being able to wake up those hours at a different time or offering whatever resource that may be on campus. So I want you to think about working on campus as a built-in resource for them, not much more of a distraction. Um, and so what we also know is that once students work over 20 hours, they get diminishing returns on their investment. So all the jobs at St. Thomas are all 20 hours or less. So if your student does need to work, because some people have to work to pay for school, work the minimum amount of hours as possible. That's, that's all I have to say about that. But I really want you to encourage your student to work on campus because all the jobs are pretty much 20 hours or less and we know that that's kind of like the maximum students should be working in a given week. Do you go somewhere to see where the job openings are on campus? Like, is there somewhere? Yeah, to so if, if we were to like, if we have time at the end, if I can be, not preach too much. But uh, if you go onto the main St. Thomas website and you scroll all the way to the bottom, it says jobs at St. Thomas. Okay. If they click that button, it gives them student employment stat like, it's our HR website, but there's a specific uh, line for student employment. And there are many jobs, I, I looked this morning because I, I taught a class, like there were five jobs posted just this, today, and there are plenty of jobs on there. So you'll find like being a research assistant, like one of the jobs is like being the manager of like the, the student manager of like the Anderson Student Center. Um, there are jobs like in the art, like there, there are jobs all over the place. And you will also find jobs also that are on the Minneapolis campus as well. So, uh, so they'll find jobs on both places. So. so with that being said, I think I really also want to encourage you to have your student to be involved on campus. The first, I'm gonna say this, remember this part. The first six weeks of them being here at St. Thomas is gonna be the most important weeks they're ever gonna have at this institution. First six weeks. So in those first six weeks, you wanna encourage them to be here as much as possible. Being in the student org, making sure they're going to classes, make sure they're going to, to making connections. So I really wanna encourage you to have them be involved on campus as much as possible. And if they really need to see you, come visit them here. Don't allow them to come back to your house, right? Especially in those first six weeks. So, one of the first things is September 23rd and 24th is Parent and Family Weekend. It's like the fourth week of school. It's a great weekend to come back to visit your student and have them on, on campus. Like there was a parent yesterday, or not, this week who was like, well, my daughter literally loves a dog. Like, what can we do? They live 30 minutes away. Bring the dog here. Come stay for a few hours, have fun, run around. Go have a coffee and then take the dog back home. Like they don't need to come home and see the dog, you can bring the dog to them, right? But I really want to encourage you in those first six weeks to have your student be involved here. We have a lot of students who are local. So they're like, well, I want to go back to my old high school. You can say, well, you have a football team there. You can literally go to a game on Saturdays. And so I really want to encourage you in those first six weeks to ensure that they're being a Tommy. And that's not just about like the student organization, like are they learning the streets? Have they found their, a restaurant to go to? All of these things that's about our community, encourage them to go to, to learn about who we are as Thomas and St. Paul. So the next two things I kind of want to talk about uh, together is about being engaged with them and being their best cheerleader. 
Now, one of the things you might notice about your student in the next month or so is that your student might have a little bit of a short fuse. They might get a little bit quicker to anger. They may be a little bit more frustrated with you. And you may even find yourself having more arguments with them than you've had before. But what I want to say about that is that that is normal, right? Your student is preparing themselves for you to drop them off and not pick them up again. It is much easier to create distance when you're mad, when you're frustrated at a person, than when everything is going fine and copacetic, right? So I want you to notice over the next couple of weeks, you may be like, okay, I, I am really sorry about that. Now, with that being said, because they have an attitude a little bit more frustrated, you may just say, you know what, deal with it yourself, right? Now, they may be presenting in ways in which they may be showing you that they don't want you to be involved. But what I want you to know is that it's all surface level. When something goes wrong, they are going to call you first. So, I want you to be intentional with them whenever they do call you. So checking in on them, make sure they're doing well, and most importantly, always be their best children. So I think as people who are supporting students for the first time or you have some years in college, between your students going to college, don't make this harder than what it is. So I'm gonna break this down real simple until this, this idea here. So, when you, you already have an experience that you have leaned into when you had to drop your student off somewhere. It was probably called preschool, okay? So when you dropped them off at preschool, you know, you probably went to work, you were like, I don't know what happened to my child. But at the end of the day, you went and picked them up, right? Join the speaker. And you typically ask them three questions. Did you have fun? Did you make a friend? Do you like your teacher? So it is no different and what happened in preschool is what's going to happen when you drop them off for college. So when you call them to be intentional with them, ask them the same questions. Are you having fun? Do you like your classes? Have you made any friends? It's no different than when you drop them off at preschool or when they're transitioning in college. It's just that they're a little bit older and you're not picking them up at the end of the day. So I think it's really important that you don't overthink this. Just continue to be a parent to them because they want you to be involved even though they may not show it. And oftentimes they don't show it because they don't know how to say it, they are scared to say it, or they don't even know it's happening to them. But when they do call you, I want you to be intentional with them about making connections, but also be their best cheerleader. You should be the one person they can call and say, I know I'm gonna get support. So encouraging them like, okay, well, let's keep it going for a little bit longer. Encourage them to make a different connection or encourage them to do that thing that they were kind of scared about, right? So I always want you to be their best cheerleader. So the quick story I'll tell about this idea about like, they gonna call you first. So when I was young, I grew up in Mississippi. I went to graduate undergrad in Colorado. My mother taught me how to wash clothes when I was very young, right? I went to college and I forgot how to work that machine, right? I didn't ask my roommate. I didn't ask my RA. I didn't ask a single person in the state of Colorado. I literally picked up the phone and called my mother and was like, how does this machine work again? It's cold water, got it, right? So you're going to often be the first person who knows when something is going wrong with them. And so that's why I think it's important that you're always intentional with them and being their best truly. Because again, they may not show you, they may not know how to tell you, but just know that when something goes south, they're going to call the people that they trust the most. Now, with that being said, I also think it's important that you treat uh, your student and this experience they have as being a partner. And what do I mean by that? Now, as uh, Linda pointed out a little bit earlier in our presentation, your students are now wanting to be a little bit more autonomous. They're not living under your roof anymore, right? And so, Oftentimes, students become frustrated it's because they want to be treated like an adult, right? But what we know is that they're still developing mentally, socially, etc. So what I have found in my work is that when you treat your student as a partner and you look at their experience of college as a partnership, 
you're more likely to get what you need from them, and they're going to be more likely to listen to you, and it's going to cause less frustration. So as a quick example of this about a partnership, now sometimes our partners do things that we don't necessarily agree with. But we continue to love and appreciate and value our partners, even though we may not disagree with what they did. So your student may call you and say, you know what, I'm thinking about going to San Diego for a spring break. And instead of saying, no, you shouldn't go to San Diego, maybe the question you ask your partner is, do you have San Diego money? Have you, I thought you said you had a midterm next week. Did you think about that? Right? How do you start to get your student to think about the decision that they need to be making as a partnership, not necessarily as a power dynamic? Because I'm going to tell you now, ultimatums do not work. They will lie to you. Okay? So I think if you treat your relationship to your student as a partnership, it's going to get you much further, and you can help them to start making some of these decisions that are going to be profound. So when they call you and say, well, I'm thinking about taking English instead of this. OK, so did you talk to your advisor about that? <coughs> Not saying, oh, well, you should do this because it's good. No. Well, did you talk to someone about it? Like, so how are you helping your student to make yeah, informed so choices? Okay. Again, you may not agree with what they decide, but at least they're having ownership in those decisions that are happening. So with that being said, I also think that it's important for you to set boundaries with your students. Because they're also going to set boundaries with you, which I'll talk about in a second. Now, for each of you, you're about to go through a similar experience as your student. There's going to be less noise in your house. There's going to be less one, one less mouth to feed. There's not going to have to go take this person this place and this and this. Your life is going to change just as much as theirs. And so I think it's important that you set boundaries with your student as well, because it's not the best thing to always let them back into your life. They're just a tornado for the weekend and then they're gone, right? Like you need to also have boundaries because your life is going to adjust and continue without them being there daily. And so I also think it's important that you set boundaries with your student so that they don't feel like it's always nice to just come home. Because it's tough for parents to be able to always have that transition like, oh, it's nice to have you, and then they're gone, right? So I also think it's important for you to also set boundaries with them that they're not always coming home each and every weekend, but then you're always constantly resetting, right? Now, with that being said, your students are often going to set boundaries with you, if you like it or not. So one day you may call them and say, I think it's really, I think you should come to grandma's 90th birthday party. And they're going to be like, what? No. Nah. So I think your students are going to set these boundaries with you because they're adjusting to a new life here at St. Thomas. So generally speaking, for every one credit that a student is in, they should be studying three hours for that class outside of class time. So most of the classes here at St. Thomas are four credits. So they should be studying somewhere between like 12 and 16 hours for one course. So once you add three or four courses to that, you're talking about a full-time job that they should be studying in general. So your students may set boundaries with you because they have academic work to do. They may be involved in research. They may be working on campus. And so when they call you and say, I cannot show up, it, it probably isn't because they don't love grandma. It's because they also have a life here, right? And so, some students may have to work at the family business. Some may have to pick up a little brother or cousin or, or help you to run an errand. But what I think is important is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's just like, well, don't come to grandma's birthday party. Well, maybe the, with your partner, the answer may be, how about you just come Saturday and go back Sunday morning? Or how about you come Friday evening and go back on Saturday? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I think sometimes there can be frustrations because we feel some type of way because they didn't show up to the thing that we wanted them to. But at the end of the day, I think it's important that your life is changing and their life is changing too. So I think it's important that you have healthy boundaries just because they're also going to set boundaries with you. And most of that is related to their academic experience here at St. Thomas. So with that being said, I think the last thing I want to really emphasize is the academic calendar. Okay? 
the academic, if you don't literally remember anything else I say today, just remember this one little thing here, academic calendar. So the academic calendar is an online resource, and the academic calendar already is set out for the next three years. So if you want to go see when classes start in fall 2025, be my guest, right? But the academic calendar, I think, helps parents and families to understand what their students are going through, and also can help you to help your student make informed decisions. So the academic calendar tells you when midterms are happening, when finals are, it tells you the tuition refund schedule, so when you can get 80% back to 60 to 40, et cetera. Or if you're planning a family vacation, it tells you when your student may need to be gone or when might not be the best time for them to leave. So if you go on a Thursday, maybe they can come on Saturday, right? So I think the academic calendar can help you to make really informed decisions. So, if your student calls you one day and says, I'm really thinking about dropping in that marketing class, right? Well, you may say, like, well, but the, academic, the calendar says that if you drop today, you get back 60%. If you wait till tomorrow, that's going to be 40%. So I think we should probably make a decision today and not tomorrow, right? And so I think the academic calendar can be a really good resource for parents and families to use because it can help you to understand how your student is transitioning but also to help them make informed decisions. Um, and again, you can just Google St. Thomas Academic Calendar and it will pop up. Just pick the right St. Thomas because there's one in Texas and Florida. So we're the purple one, okay? So, so, I, will, so I really want to emphasize the Academic Calendar is going to be one of your most important um, assets that you can have. So I really want to encourage you to download that. It's just an online thing. Uh, but the academic calendar is going to be your best friend along the way. So last thing I'll say, because I always get a call about it at least twice a year, or at least in the fall. We only get Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving. <laughs> I didn't make the calendar. That's just how it is, okay? So we only get Thursday and Friday off. So if you want to do something before the end, you'll have to have your student walk, talk to your professor. But we only get Thursday and Friday. I don't make the calendar, okay? So, um, but, I, but in all seriousness, I do think that academic calendar can help you to make really informed decisions. So, um, again, I really want you to be prepared that things are going to shift and change. It's all normal. I think you can help your students to make some really informed decisions. Always be their best cheerleader, even though they, don't wanna sh they may not show you those ways. And I think if you treat this as a partnership, it may help you to get a lot further than what you think with your students. So last thing I'll say, because the next thing just says questions on there. Um, uh, sometimes your partner may come to you and be like, I want to go to summer school, or I want to go, I want to take class doing J term, right? J term, winter term. So J term typically happens like J January like second to like right after like let's just call it January twenty fifth. It's a very short period of time. J term and summer are typically not covered by financial aid. Now, tuition is 50% off during those two times, but if you didn't plan for that money, <laughs> you're gonna need to pay that money because financial aid typically doesn't cover those two times, right? And so I think it's really important that you understand that. So when your student calls you and say, oh, I want to do this during J term, that just know that typically their financial aid doesn't cover that time, or if they're thinking about going to summer school, it's the same thing. So if you haven't budgeted for that, you might just want to help your students to remember that, well, we don't have this covered unless they could be paying for it themselves. But, but I just think it's important you know that about J term and summer. Now, generally speaking, a lot of students use J term to study abroad. That's when we have like the most students who leave to go to study abroad. So, any questions? DNS and Peggy does? I'm just going to ask you this. Yeah, you know, it's about the little paper, it's about how many students are going to be in the first time. No, he's just asking about financial aid, but I think he's asking about how to apply for those or how to be sure which loans uh, his daughter has? Yeah, so the best thing to do is, uh, 
is to do, so is to have their student reach out to financial aid, mm -hmm. and they can talk with them about what they actually got in the financial aid package. I have a card from financial aid if they want to take a picture of it. So I always want to encourage folks, if you ever need me, you can always email me, call me, reach out to me. Email is always the best. But I'm always here to be a support to parents and families. That's part of my job. And so always feel free to reach out if you have questions uh, or concerns. Um, summers are 50% off tuition. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many students do you, do you have any idea how many students you typically have here in the summer? Not a ton. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A lot of students who may be taking, um, who, you know, because once you transfer, like once you become the same time, they get pretty strict about how many credits you can transfer back in, which is typically eight credits that you could transfer in after you started at St. Thomas. But we still, we have still probably the majority of our students are going to take classes at Normandale, Century, you know, some of those, those local community colleges, if they are going to take transfer back units or whatnot, they, most of them are still going to other institutions. Now, there again, there are just some students who want to take classes during summer term and they choose to take them here. Um, but it, it really, I really do think it just depends on can you afford to pay it? And if you can, I think students like being in the system, they know it, et cetera, but for some folks, they do have to go take a class at another institution. But you can only typically transfer back eight credits once you start at St. Thomas, they get pretty strict about what you can transfer after that standpoint. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's, that's the same thing I'll say if your student did PSEO or AP and all that, you might want to stay on top of them about making sure they got the sent the scores, did we receive it, et cetera, because that also can shift the student's schedule and things like that. So you just want to stay on top of them over the next couple weeks about a lot of those things they tend to think is, you know, like, I mean, they're just thinking about all these other things, but like the amount of students who did send it in or sent it to the wrong St. Thomas, <laughs> it's just like, bro, like, it literally says St. Paul. Anyway, but, uh, so yeah, but you want to check in with your student about those things, I would say for sure. Okay, so. so if my student has questions about the PSDO and things transferring, who's her best uh, contact for that? Um, at this time, uh, it will be academic counseling. And so uh, orientation, orientation's end on Monday. So what I would encourage them to do is to, uh, they can either send an email to academic counseling and set an appointment with someone, or every day between, I, I wanna say is between like uh, nine and four o'clock, you can just hop in a Zoom room and talk to someone. Okay. So they can do it on Zoom too if they just want to hop in and talk to someone. Um, but probably the best bet would just be to email academic counseling and set up an appointment and someone can talk to them about it. But they may also mention it to you because they probably talked about it during registration today too. Um, because they're like, why don't we take this class? Or, you know, because yeah, she had them. a lot of questions and I said, I hopefully you'll get Yeah, yeah, so they should talk to them by then, yeah. yeah. But in some of it, just they just can't do in that a lot of amount of time. So we encourage them to do academic counseling, and they'll support them for sure. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for joining again, and uh, please let me know how I can be a support for sure. Thank you, buddy. Thank you.